Hello, welcome to White Baby Gardening and Worm Farm. Today we'll be having another discussion on worm farming. So how are you guys doing today? I hope all is going well. Yes, it's good to be here with you guys once again. So today we're going to be discussing more about worm farming. We don't have any specific topic relating to worm farming that we're going to be discussed, as you may have noticed from the title of the live, that I didn't put any definite title for what we're going to be discussing as long as it's worm far, because it's going to be all over the place. <laughs> yes, so first off, we are going to be talking about why your worms are not coming up into the top portion of your worm bin. So if you had new food to your worm bin long before the worms finished the food that they had before, oh hi CC, then the worms will continue working on the old material for more than one reason. They're already comfortable where they are. They have food there, so they're not going to leave to go to the new, new food source. And then also, the older food source would have had more bacteria growing on it. And since that's what the worms are eating, then they're not going to leave the location where they're quite comfortable with plenty of food to eat to go to the new food source. So that could be one of the reasons why the worms are not moving upwards in your bin. The next thing is that if the top level of your bin is not wet enough, then the worms will stay where they have the amount of moisture that they need. Or if you are using worm bins that consist of multiple trays, and if you had another tray before the worms finish working on the food scraps that is in the lower tray, then they're not going to move up for the same reason that like the first one I gave. They're already comfortable. They have enough food, so they won't move up. Now, how can you get rid of potworm or at least reduce their population in your worm bin? Because little insects in your worm bin, you won't be able to completely get rid of them. Oh, hi, mom. Yes, you won't be able to fully get rid of them, but at least you are able to get them under control. So what are some things that you can do to control the potworm population in your bin? One very effective method is to soak a slice of bread in milk and then place it on top of the content in your worm bin. Oh, hi, Han White. Place it on top of the content in your worm bin for whatever reason, potworms seem to love it. And so they will go on the bread, they will go in the bread, and then you can remove that and keep repeating the process until you get the population under control. I'm doing okay. How are you guys doing? Exhausted as usual, but I'm doing okay. Yes, so that's one way that you can control the potworm population in your worm bin. So the next one is to allow your bin to dry out a bit. You don't want it to fully dry out because you know the worms, your compost worms need those moisture in order to breathe. So you're not going to allow it to dry out fully, but dry out as much as you possibly can because potworms love when there is a lot of moisture in the bin. The next step that you can take to reduce your potworm population 
is by reducing the level of acidity in your bin because once you start to see a lot of potworms in your bin, it's an indication that your bin is too acidic. You can, your bin will be acidic for several reasons. Let's see, and where it says, I'm well, just finished working for the week. Okay, lovely. Hi, healthy. How are you doing? Yes, I'm doing okay. Yeah, so your worm bin will be acidic either because you had it too much acidic food or if you are not aerating your bin enough and if you're overfeeding your bin because when your bin is when your bin has too much food that the worms cannot consume fast enough it is going to start to rot or to break down and it's going to create an acidic environment which is why you may need to make sure that you are aerating the bin as much as is possible now let's see he says going out into the hot yard to work finally got material to finish my garden beds so behind but i'm here now I'll be mostly listening. Okay, my dear. Have fun making those worm beds. Worm beds, the garden beds. <laughs> yes, have fun, my dear. Yeah, I know what you mean when you say you're behind because, I don't know, this, this season has been, first, it was cold for too long, and right after it got too cold, it got too hot. <laughs> so it's all over the place. Oh, hi, Giathi. It has been a long, long time indeed. It's been a very long time. How are you doing? Yes, yeah, so it has been a rather strange garden season. In fact, for me personally, as some of you who regularly watch my channel know, I am far behind because of the many challenges that I've been facing, including dealing with those fungus knots that almost decimated my seedlings. But I'm finally catching up, so it's not too bad. Let's see. Okay, you're doing fine, Jyothi. That's good. Hi, 254 Nature Growers. Thank you all for being here on the live. Yes, so as we were saying, those are the ways that you can control the potworm population by aerating your garden, not overfeeding, not feeding too much acidic food, drying out your worm bin a bit, and by using bread soaking milk and then removing that. Hi, Darla Nowak. Love your last video. I also talk to my worms and dogs and in inanimate objects. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, good. That means I'm not going crazy. <laughs> Healthy says, yes, it's been up and down and up and down here too. Like we didn't have spring. That's exactly how it feels here because spring for us is around the 21st or so of march until the 20th of june on records that is but we had snow all the way in the third week of may usually the last week of april would be when we get our last snow we had snow the third week in may we and before that before we had that snow the third week in may we had temperature in May that was 32 degrees Celsius. And we don't usually get that until July, but yet still we've had that in, in May. So it has been a very bipolar <laughs> weather, but yeah, we'll see what happens this year. A lot of us are doing so many preparation for gardens, but the one thing that we cannot really control is the the weather we just have to do our best and hope for the best 
Let's see. Jody says, see you soon, friend. Okay, okay, my dear. No, oh, and White says they didn't have spring there in London either. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't think anybody got spring, it would seem. <laughs> it's just from one straight into the other. Winter straight to summer. LP says, I put a heavy load of brown and greens in my bins last week. Six days later, it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 38 Celsius in the bin. Wow, that's super hot. In my blue and red, red worm bins, and they seem to be just fine. Wow, really? Well, that's nice. Let's see, 254 Nature says, sometimes we get so busy in the garden. That is true. That is true, but my garden has been neglected quite a lot this year because I am busy otherwise and it's not as if I can put aside what I am doing in order to tend to the garden the way I should. So I do spend a lot of time in there, but not as much as is needed. But yeah, eventually I will be able to relax a bit and spend more time in there. <laughs> Geoffy um, says, hi, Han or Hannah. I no respond from you, friend. LP says, nobody had spring. That's tragic. We've had a lot of hot weathers and are in seven inches behind in rain. Wow. Yes, the weather is crazy all over here. So right, 254 nature. Hi, New Art Gardener. Oh, you haven't missed much. We spoke about why worms are not coming up into the top layer of your bins when you had new food. And we spoke about how you can control the potworm population in your bin. So those are the only things that you've missed out on apart from us chit-chatting with each other. Yeah, so you haven't missed much. We've only been going for 13 minutes now. Oh, hi, Russell. Hi, Leafy Wiggy. Hi, Melanie. Let's see. LP says it's 100 Fahrenheit or 38 Celsius where I had the material, grass, weeds, cardboards, spoiled and, pick and pickled juices, thawed food waste, aged compost, and sheep manure. Oh, you just give it to them, didn't you? <laughs> That's a nice feeding they got there, but man, how did they make out? You said they did well even in the 38 degrees C. That is so good. Yeah, well, we have been having, well, I don't even know what to describe the weather has, but we have been having a lot of, I don't know if I should say a lot of rain, but practically every day it is overcast and we get a small, very, very small amount of rain. It is not even enough to water the garden. Sometimes it is. And when it is enough to water the garden, you'll get the rain for maybe 10, 15 minutes. A nice little shower, not too heavy, not too light. And for the times when it lasts longer than that, it's just sporadic throughout the day, but it's just barely drizzling. So you don't really even get enough to water the garden. But... At least it's not too hot and it's not too cold. So I noticed that my worm bins outside, even though it seemed to be raining quite frequently now, because we're not getting enough worm, enough rain, so sometimes I still have to be wetting down the bin. Especially for my tiered worm bin, I noticed that the upper portion, because the bottom is a flow-through system, so... Because of that, it has hair flow through the bottom, it has hair flow through the sides, and the entire surface of the bin is open, so it dries out like really fast. Usually I would wet down my worm bin every 
seven days or so. Sometimes I'd let it go longer than that. But with this particular one, I have to wait it like every two or so days. It's, it dries out so fast. I noticed that last year, but I wasn't really paying much attention to it. So I think that that's why last year the worm production in there was not as good, even though it is outdoors, because it wasn't as moist as it should be. So this year I'm on it like matlock. Okay, let's see. Han White says, go green, how are you? I'm outside in the garden, so I am mainly listening. Everybody is in the garden today, it seems, except for me. <laughs> Let's see. Halif Wiggy says, transplanted long overdue plants today. Excellent. Excellent. Newark Gardener says, we've had rain every day for the past two weeks or longer, and the humidity has sat in. Okay. I hope it's not too much rain, though, that it can be damaging to your plants. Yeah. Okay, so how can you identify soja fly larvae in your worm bin? They grow to about an inch long. They are white at first and then eventually they become dark gray in color. Now should you be alarmed if you find that you have soja fly larvae in your worm bin? No, you don't need to be alarmed. You might not want them in there, but you don't need to be alarmed because they are not harmful to your worm bin. It's just that nobody really wants to see maggots in their worm bin, but they're not harmful to your worm bin. They're actually very good composters. So you can remove them similar to how you would remove the pot worms. So you would get your bread and soak it in milk and put it in there. Allow two or three days to pass. And as the larvae, the soldier fly larvae move into the bread, then you remove it every two or three days. And then you keep on repeating the process. Okay. Can you put compost worms in your garden? Sure you can. As long as you have enough organic matter in your garden for them to feed on. And if you keep the garden, if you're able to keep the garden moist all year round, then yes, you can put the compost worms in your garden. So if you're gonna put your compost worms in your garden, then you need to make sure that you cover the garden with a layer of mulch because this will help to trap moisture. Let's see, Russell says about potworms. I double grind Achling Chow and had calcium boost. When when eggshells are used, the potworms population rise. When brown oyster shell is used, no noticeable potworms. Oh interesting. When eggshell is used, the potworm population rise. I wonder if that's why I'm having a larger population of potworms because my beans should not be acidic. I'm not overfeeding my worms, especially food scraps, because as you guys know, I give my worms very small amount of food scraps, so I'm not overfeeding them and I'm not feeding acidic food. Occasionally, there might be a piece of onion peel in there, but I'm not feeding them acidic food, but yet still my bin, once I feed food scraps, there tend to be a lot of potworms. So now I'm wondering, could it be the eggshell since as you mentioned that? I wonder what is it about the eggshell because they like, the potworms love conditions that are acidic and the, and the eggshell reduce the acidity in the bin. So what is it that actually caused the population to rise? What is it about the eggshell that they like? I might have to research that.
Okay. Let's see. Melanie says, I finally harvested all my turnips and free up some space to plant other stuff. Got eight pounds. Nice. Very nice. I'm so jealous of you guys harvesting here and there. <laughs> I'm nowhere near that yet. I did notice a few scotch bonnet peppers on my scotch bonnet plant. And funny enough, the ones that I transplanted into the main garden, they are not doing so well. And I figure maybe it might have something to do with too much. I don't think, no, the main garden shouldn't have too much compost in there. Because, I mean, it is more soil than it is compost. But whatever the case may be, they're not doing so well. I noticed that the cutworms are cutting off a few of the branches off of them. But the one that I had remaining in the container that I had it in, it has quite a few scotch bonnet on it, so I'm pretty happy. At least I'm seeing some progress there. <laughs> yes, I was very surprised when I saw the scotch bonnets on it because they were about the size of my thumb head. And I didn't see them there a week or so ago. So I was pretty happy when I saw a few of them. But that's nice. Eight pounds of turnip. You're doing well. Leafy Wiggy says, that explain why my potworm population before I started drying. Okay. Yeah, so I guess reduce the amount of eggshell then. Yeah. I also noticed that when I had the eggshells, the ground eggshells to my worm bin, although it is reducing the acidity in the bin, I noticed that when I harvest my castings, there is a lot of tiny white particles in the casting and i figured it is the eggshell that has broken down to an extent but not fully broken down so sometimes you might mistake it for maybe mites or other insects in your worm bin but then it's not moving so you know it's not mites but i do notice that and i also notice when i have the eggshell in the casting the casting Although it feels fluffy, it does not feel as fluffy as when there is no eggshell in there. So now I'm wondering if I need to put down my... Because I sell my castings sometimes, I might have to put those castings down for the eggshell to break down even further. So we'll see. I'm going to keep observing. Let's see. back up a bit i think there was someone new on the live that i forgot to say hi to because i was saying hi to someone else let's check if that was so oh yes i did say hi to her okay good okay so i didn't leave anyone behind Okay, New Art Gardeners, you have harvested a few, or at least you've gotten a few strawberries. Does that mean you harvested strawberries, or does that mean you got a few strawberry plants? Okay, Melanie, you can't wait for your scotch bonnet to start blossoming. Russell says, I do believe that there is a connection to eggshells and potworms. I have monitored every ingredient I use very closely. Every input brings something to the table. Okay. Okay, that's good. My worms still eat eggshells every day. Yeah, so, yeah, because I don't really, I would still use the eggshell in my worm bin, even if it is causing potworms. I would just, some of my worm bins actually have way 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 too much eggshell in there because last year when i was collecting was that last year yeah no that would have been 2019 to early 2020 yes yeah, so just before the pandemic so 2019 about october september october i started collecting food scraps from a local restaurant and I would get a lot of eggshells. 
Now these eggshells, I did not grind them because they were going in my compost bin and not my worm bin. So I just crushed them a little bit and put them in there. But then I feed the composting material to my worms. So I ended up with a lot of different sizes of eggshell in my worm bins. So some of my worm bins have way, way too much eggshells in there. So maybe that's how my worm, my potworm population got out of hand in the first place. Yeah, and then by adding the food scraps to the bin that they love to feed on, maybe that just make it worse for them, make a better environment for them to grow with their population. So we'll see. I'm going to keep an eye on it now that you mention it. Okay, New Art Gardeners, you harvested. Well, that's good. That's good. My kids' strawberry started blossoming maybe a month or more ago but i picked off most of the blossom because i didn't want it to i want the plants to spread out in their garden and i only left one plant flowering so there is nothing for them to harvest just yet but if their plants are doing well those that i transplanted from the kids garden because of the amount of compost in the bin most of them are badly burned to the point where they look as if they are dead but then now i'm starting to see new leaves growing on at least two of them so i'm hopeful that they will survive and be okay let's see leafy says i need to invest into a big bag of oyster shell flour okay can you get that locally here I don't, I don't know what, what is available here. <laughs> I'd probably have to go to one of those feed places or one of those places that have garden supplies to find out what's available. Let's see what it says. The bullet type grinders are the ones I use, are the ones I have found durable during the mill oyster shell before sifting okay okay yeah so we were discussing whether or not you can put compost worm in your worm bin and we mentioned that um, you can but you have to make sure that you have enough organic matter for them to feed on and that you cover them with mulch because that is going to help to trap the moisture. Now, if your garden experience freezing winter, then your compost worms are most likely to die because they're not borrowing worms. And so if they realize that they're going to die, they're going to lay a lot of eggs and these cocoons can survive the winter. So even though the worms may die, the cocoons will hatch, and so you will always have worms in your garden. Right, so you can add them to your garden, but you just know that once the time gets cold, if you're in a cold environment, you're going to lose a lot of them. Oh, I'm so sorry, Melanie. All your strawberry plants died. Yeah, that's sad. So are you going to get more to plant or are you just going to forget about it until next year? Do you know why they died? Okay, now if you don't add worms to your garden but you're adding worm castings to your garden, depending on where your supply of castings come from, it may contain cocoons. So that's another way that you can get worms in your garden because these cocoons are going to hatch as soon as the temperature is warm enough. And with time, your worm population will start to grow. Now, if you have raised beds and you are so inclined, as your worm population grow, you might want or choose to harvest those worms. But of course, you're going to have to be on the lookout for 
regular earthworms because these cannot be used as composting worms. Okay, so can you feed your worm garden refuse? Sure you can, but there is a drawback to doing so. If you want your bin to be harvested regularly, then the challenge that you're going to have when you feed your worms garden refuse is that the stem of your plant is going to be hard, which means that it's going to take a longer time to break down. So it is better to feed your worms food scraps rather than the garden refuse. And if, however, you're going to feed them garden refuse and you have time on your hand, you can always separate the leafy part of the plants from the stem and feed the leafy part to them. The rest of it you can add to your compost and as it breaks down, then you can give the compost to your worms. Yes, so it's better to compost the harder portion of the plant. If you don't have time to be separating the leafy part from the stem, then compost everything. Then you can give that to your worms or just focus on feeding them regular food scraps. Now, here is a question that a lot of worm farmers are always asking. How can you keep ants out of your worm bin? So I'm just going to share a few tips on how you can keep ants out or at least reduce their population in your worm bin. So if your bin is too acidic or too dry, it will attract ants. So you can use diatomaceous earth to get rid of them. When you dry out your bin or reduce the acidity in your bin, that is going to help to control them. Cinnamon also repel ants. It does not kill them, but it will repel them. So you can add cinnamon to your garden. It is the smell of the cinnamon that repels the ants. So if the cinnamon becomes wet, it can become washed away and the scent will be gone. So then the hands are going to return. So if you're using cinnamon, it is something that you have to stay on top of and continually add cinnamon to your garden or your worm farm. Melanie says, no, I don't know why, but I am trying some wild from the yard. Okay, lots of blossom and tiny berries. Yes, I have some wild strawberries that uh, we got from a friend's property about maybe two years ago. And I planted them in one of my little strawberry raised bed. They started blossoming months ago, but the strawberries were just tiny, tiny little things. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to just keep watching and see what happens with that. If it is worth having them or should I get rid of them? Time will tell. Or maybe I should plant them in the ground underneath my fruit tree since says that environment mimic where I got them from. Okay, so the next thing that you can do to control the ants in your worm bin is to use cornmeal. Cornmeal, however, will attract more of the ants, but because they cannot digest the cornmeal, so the cornmeal will kill them. Okay, New York Gardener says, I didn't know you could eat wild strawberries. Yeah, you can eat wild strawberries. Most of those wild berries, and notice when I say wild berries, I'm talking about like the ones, the, the type of berries you'd buy in the store, and not just about any berries, because a lot of berries are poisonous, so don't. <laughs> Don't go and just eat any berries you see out there in the wild. But yeah, your wild strawberries, blueberries, um, straw raspberries and stuff like that, the wild ones can be eaten. Hi, Kiki. Yeah, so the next thing is crushed eggshell, um, oyster, 
shell, diatomaceous earth, dolomite, dolomite or garden lime can reduce the acidity in your bin. And if you reduce the acidity in your bin, then that can reduce your ants population too. Oh, you've, um, you've never seen wild strawberries. Yeah. I've never really seen the fruit per se. I just saw that a lot of the lot of the plants were growing out in the wild, so I decided to take some home to see how they would do. So we'll see. I don't really expect them to grow as large as other berries, but we'll see if it is worth having them. Another thing that you can do to control ants in your worm bin is to create a barrier between the worm bin and the ants. And you can do that in two ways. One, place the base of your bin in water. Make sure that there is a gap between the ants and the worm bin because the ants are not going to swim across. They can't swim. So they're not going to attempt to swim across to get to your worm bin. So if your bin has legs, then it is much easier to do this because you can just put the legs of your worm bin in water. But then if your, bin's the, your bin does not have legs, then you'd have to put the entire bin in a larger container with water. If you're doing this, you want to make sure that the bin is not going to absorb any of the water from whatever it is that you are putting it in because you don't want your bin your worm bin to absorb water and then have too much moisture in there because that would not be good for your worms so if your bin doesn't have legs and you don't want to put the bin in containers in a container of water the other option that you have is to put vaseline around your bin Yeah, so it is to put Vaseline around your bin. So on the lower portion of your bin, around the entire bin, you don't want to leave any gap because the ants will get through. So you and around the entire bin, I'm not saying the entire height of your bin, but just create a bead of Vaseline around your bin and that will be enough to deter the ants as well. So that is another method that you can use to control ants in your worm bin. So question for you guys, do any of you use plant refuse or garden refuse in your worm bin? While I don't put garden refuse directly in my worm bins, I do have garden refuse in my compost bin because I'm composting it. And I've always been adding worms to my compost bin or at least to some of my compost bin. Okay, take care, urban girl. Have a lovely day. Yes, so I don't really put garden refuse in my worm bin, but then I do have my compost bin that I had these worms to. So we will see how that do. Over the years since I've been adding worms to my compost bin, all the previous years I would have worms to the bin that is either fully processed or fully composted or partially composted. And then for the ones that I'm just starting that compost bin, I would not put any worms in that one. But this year I have worms in all three compost bins. So we will see how they work. Oh, they turn out where the garden refuse is con concerned. Now, the reason why putting garden refuse in your worm bin, oh yes, I mentioned that already, why putting it in your worm bin is not such a good idea, especially if you're in a race against time. So now that I've decided to put worms in all of my worm bins, well, my compost bin, Although this year I'm only, I only did that because we had a late start with spring, if you can call that spring. So because we had a late start, usually 
in March, my compost bin would be heating up. And by May, June, it would have gone through the heat process already. And then it would just stay there and break down further, but not heating up. So now, because we had such a late start this year, and I want to have all of those material composted, so now I had worms to all the compost bin. So we're going to see how they perform where the garden refuse is concerned. So now that I did that next year, I think if I'm going to be adding worms to my compost bin that has the garden refuse, I'm going to be cutting up those refuse very small so that it will be a lot easier for um, to break down and for the worms to eat it. Let's see, Russell says, I do in my outdoor bin. I once fed my indoor worm bin wild lettuce and I introduced rosette mites to the bin. Rosette mites, I've never really heard of those. Are they related to rosette potatoes? And what was the result when you added the um, rosette mites to the bin? Okay, you cut them up and white. Okay, yeah. I didn't have any intention of putting any worms in that bin, so I never thought of cutting them up. So if I'm going to do that next year, then I will make sure that I cut them up so that the worms can process them faster because... If I didn't put worm in there, it would be passing through the eat process, so I know that it would break down really fast. But this year, none of my compost bin is going to be, I'm not going to be hot composting this year. So, yeah, that's where I'm at. <laughs> now, I've heard of instances where some people will use borax in their worm farm because it is good at killing certain insects. Should you use borax in your worm bin? Now let's consider some facts about borax. One, it is a cleaning agent. Two, it is a salt. Three, it kills ants, roaches, mites, spiders, and other insects. Four, it does not kill aphids. It does not kill ticks or insect larvae. Five, it is antifungal, so it will kill things like bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. Six, those who had it to their worm bins say that their worms stay away from it. So when we consider these facts, what do you think? Do you think we should put borax in our worm bin? Let's take a closer look. Worms do not survive or thrive well in clean environment. They hate salt. Worms feed on bacteria. So if we use borax in the worm bin, the borax is going to kill the bacteria. And if it kills the bacteria, the worms don't have anything to eat. Because the worms don't eat your food scraps, they eat the bacteria that breaks down your food scraps. So if we use borax, it's going to kill the bacteria so there won't be anything for your worms to eat. Now, in addition to that, nematodes, fungi, um, protozoa, and bacteria. All of these are very important to your plant life and to your soil. So if you put borax in whether your compost or in your worm bin, it's going to have a negative effect on your soil life. So borax is not something that you want to use in your compost or in your worm bin. Now, because it kills a certain pest, if you want to use it on your plants, 
then that might be a possibility. Be careful of the strength of it. But as for your worm bin and for your soil, your compost, I would definitely not recommend it. And there are so many alternatives that I wouldn't even use it on my plants as a pesticide because there are so many alternatives. Because you're going to have beneficial insects on your plants too. So if you're using the borax to get rid of some, you might get rid of the ones you don't want to get rid of. Let's see, Russell says, they are like spider mites. Okay, the rosette mites. No web, damaged leaves. The mites were on the tomato that year along with the lettuce. I am thankful for the regular supply of mites, of mighty mites. <laughs> Okay, well, that's good. I wonder what they look like. Where's my where's my paper for my notes? Oh. Run away. Okay, then I'll just have to write it on this. Can we call the reset tonight? Right, so as I was saying, don't make that mistake of using the borax in your worm bin. Okay, so that's all I have for you guys today. So if you guys want to talk about anything, then I'm game. <laughs> My garden is coming on quite nicely. I'm quite happy. I was a bit sad there when my plants died. But the new set that I transplanted, they're doing pretty good. So, yeah, I figured as much, Russell, that uh, Mighty Mites is what you, you are calling them and not necessarily the real name. <laughs> I just laughed because I think about Mighty Mouse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so my plants, they're doing, they're doing much, much better. And although I have the neem oil, not neem oil, um, the BT to control the cutworms, I haven't been able to use it yet because it's constantly raining. And although we are not getting a lot of rain, I don't know. I don't want to put it on the plants and then they get washed off. So Russell, since as you're the one who introduced the BTK to me, do you know if the rain is going to wash it off if I put it on the plants or will it still remain on the plants after? Yeah, that would be good to know. I didn't want to take any chance and use it and then and then not um, get the benefit from it. So I'm still waiting, but I don't know how long this rainy season is going to last. It does seem to be going on for quite some time. We had rain from yesterday, about 7 o'clock in the evening, and it's still going even now, but every now and then you'll get a burst of it, nothing heavy, but it's not really falling heavily, so I don't want to put the BTK on the plants just yet, but in the meantime, I have been going out regularly and using the neem oil i don't mind you using the neem oil spray on the plants even if it's raining because at least i know that the neem oil is cheap and they have a lot of it so unlike the btk that is only in small supplies the neem oil will not really kill the cutworms but it will affect their rate of reproduction and if it is on their larvae, then it will prevent the larvae from hatching. So for that reason, I continue to use the neem oil. I haven't seen any more plants being cut down. They still continue to damage my peas. I don't know. I don't seem to be fortunate with peas. I tried peas last year for the first time. And I'm trying peas this year for the second time. But last year, the cutworms decimated it. I planted more peas this year than last year and 
it's the same thing. Last year, I was able to dig around the plant root and find the cutworms. This year, I'm not able to find them at all. I don't know. I don't know if maybe because I have the mulch, the wood chip mulch there, it makes it more difficult to see them or what the case may be. Or maybe the cutworms I'm looking for is not the type that is there. Maybe the ones that are there are smaller. I don't know, but I can't seem to find them. Yeah, so... I think next year if I'm growing peas, I'm not going to be putting them in the ground. I'm going to be trying them in containers. Now my beans, those I'm looking forward to, but since I planted them, not one of them has germinated. So I am very disappointed because especially my lima beans, well, those are the ones that haven't germinated. And I'm definitely looking forward to my lima beans, but not one of them has germinated. So... And I planted all the beans I had. So I might have to go out and get some more. My red kidney beans, however, those are doing very well. They didn't take too long to germinate. The plants are looking well. And so far is only one of them that got affected by cutworms. So I'm pretty happy about that. My corns are doing healthy too. They did not get affected by the cutworms either. Not yet. Anyway, one of my cucumbers... After I replanted my cucumbers, one of them got destroyed by the cutworms. But I'm quite sad because for the first time since I started planting cucumbers, I'm not having a lot of germination at all. And um, some of these seeds, are I just bought them. So it's not as if I've had them for a long time. The one that I had for a long time, that did not germinate, which I expected because I got them from a lady that I bought my greenhouse from, and that was at least four years ago. I don't know how long she's had that, but as for the other cucumbers, I don't know, they're not doing too well at all. So I'm a bit disappointed with that. But we'll see for the few plants that I have, how they will do. Okay, you said you think it will wash off the BDK, but you're not sure. Okay. Homestead Heart has the same problem too. All of her watermelon died. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know, most of my melons, I planted them, I started the seeds early indoors. And they did not germinate. Two of them germinated and the fungus knots got to them. And I was growing five different types of watermelon. Um, the ones that I saw outdoors, I see only one plant germinate. I don't know if it is too late to start over because I was thinking of doing that. But I think I'll just let it go. Maybe if I go to the lumber yard, lumber yard, <laughs> if I go to the... Uh, <laughs> if I go to the garden center and see them with melon plants, then I might get a few. But I don't know. I think it might be too late for me to start from seeds at this time. So I don't mind too much, though, not having the melon, except that I hate to fail. Yeah, I don't like melons, but my kids love it. So for their sake, I would try again. Let's see. I hope that the BTK worked as good as the BTI because I use BTI and I do not have flying insects except the occasional darkling beetle. Oh, never heard of that one. One more thing to research. And he says, I am having problem with my peas too. Some, some black bugs are eating some of them. Okay. Yeah. Are they tiny bugs or are they big bugs? I know that beans, beans, um, some little tiny black fly looking things are bugs tend to love beans and peas especially if it start blossoming so you might want to treat that with some home pe homemade pesticide or store-bought pesticide neem oil work well for 
a lot of those little tiny fly like bug, bugs that love to be on your peas and beans. Oh, your snap peas are doing great. Lots of blossom. That's excellent. Excellent. Just planted out six watermelon and is keeping my fingers crossed. Okay, all the best with that. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can find some melon at the garden center. Um, the major garden centers, I haven't been to any of them this year. I don't really go anywhere if I don't have to because of the pandemic. And I'm never really someone who likes going up and down in the first place. So, yeah. Russell says, I am really excited about beans and corns. The combination is me is making a competition. Okay. Yeah, so I have my beans and my corn planted together, which is how we usually grow them in Jamaica. And the beans... Although I soak both the beans and the corns, the beans germinated first. The beans are bigger. And in the instances where the corn germinated first, the beans are still bigger than the corns. But the beans can only grow so much and no further, depending on the type of beans. I'm growing my, my corns with red kidney beans. Yes. So now I need to go and get myself some broad beans because I really want a nice harvest of broad bean. Not broad bean, yeah, not broad bean. <laughs> uh, lima beans. Because I, I wanted to grow enough lima bean that I can have until the next growing season. That was my aim. But so far, not even one of them has germinated. So I am so disappointed. But I won't give up. I think I'm going to try again. But this time, if I try again, I'm going to put them in containers so that if push comes to shove, I can always move them indoors. And, but I'll have to stick them in the container, but I can at least move them indoors to ensure that if we, if our, if our gardening season should come to an end, then at least I'll be able to still rescue the beans and have some to harvest. Let's see. And White says, my green peas are producing and also my broad beans. Nice, nice. Yeah. Just thinking about my lima beans, I'm just, so, <laughs> I'm just so sad because I was really, really looking forward to it. But the fact that not even one of them germinate, I wonder if maybe when I bought the beans, I got a bad batch. And White those lima beans that I sent you, did any of them germinate at all? Now that I think about it, I need to know if it was a bad batch of beans I got. Yeah, well, I'm going to try again. This year, I'm going to have quite a few things that I'm going to be overwintering. And speaking of overwintering... I went to the store and I saw some purple Japanese yam or purple sweet potatoes. So I bought some and I cooked some of them and then I just cut the little top that tends to sprout the most um, slips and planted those heads. And then I left one behind. It was in my cupboards and I noticed that it started sprouting some slips. So I stick that in water. I know I'm a little I'm late in starting it because usually you'd start your slips in April and it is now June. So I don't expect that I'm going to be harvesting anything from it at the end of the growing season. So I'm going to be putting them in, growing them in containers small enough that I can move them around. And since as without grow lights, they did so well on my windowsill. Um over the winter this year so i'm going to be bringing them i'm going to have them outdoors for the growing season and then i'm going to bring them indoors when the season ends because as you guys may have seen from one of my previous videos that the japanese yam actually start producing while it was in the small containers so i'm going to keep it indoors and see what happens 
I don't know if this one that I got just now, if it is the same variety where within three, four months it starts producing, we'll find out. But anyway, yes, I'm going to be growing them. And I bought some sweet potatoes from the Jamaican store. And those started to sprout in the cupboards too. So I put those in water because I want to see what's going to happen. It will be very interesting to see. And then I'm trying something new. So the peel of the purple Japanese yam, I put that. I know it will do well in soil. It will grow. So now I put some in a Ziploc bag and dampen it. Sometimes I close it, sometimes I open it so that it can get a bit of air. So I want to see if that method will cause the peel to sprout. And I'm not sure if I should keep it closed or if I should keep it open or if using both methods is best, but maybe I should separate them and have three sets so one set I would keep closed, one set I would keep open, and then the other set I would um, open and close and see what happens with them. It will be interesting to see what the result is. Let's jot that down. I'm going to do that. So I'm going to use that as a little experiment. Oh, hi, getting clean on the prairies. So that is going to be my little experiment. It doesn't matter if nothing grows from any of the three of them, but that is going to be my little experiment. Okay, let's see. And White says, planted a few more radish, kales, carrots, purple top turnips, rainbow beets, and bold hardy beetroots okay nice my beets are not doing well i am so disappointed i have no beets and i planted so much but i have no beets i'm wondering if maybe if i started them indoors if they would have been okay but none of the beets i planted outdoors even the set that i mentioned previously that germinated and was looking kind of okay they haven't grown past half an inch and now i go there i can't even see a beet beet plant a beetroot plant so i don't know i'm so disappointed though because i was really looking forward to them but if nothing happens i'll just convert convert that those beetroot beds into something else let's see Russell says, this morning I was spending extra time examining potatoes. At this time, no potato bugs. Lovely. Yeah, I found one more potato bugs bug the following day. So that's four of them I found. So three on one plant and one on the other plant. I haven't been outside since day because it's kind of raining. So I don't know if there's any there. I'm going to have to get out there and look anyway. Yeah. But the good news is that I haven't seen any eggs or any larvae on the leaf of the plant. So I think maybe they were just starting to appear, the potato bugs. So they haven't reached the stage where they could do any damage yet. And speaking of potato bugs, that is going to be the topic for Monday's live. So we're going to be discussing everything I can think of about them how to get rid of them, what they look like, the damage, pretty much everything there is to discuss about them. So you can stay tuned for that and how to treat them. In my yard. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah, they say once you get them, if when you just started getting, getting them, you don't get them under control right away, it is really hard to get rid of them afterwards. Yeah, but that's okay. Um, it's good that you don't see any of them. 
this time around. one of it see i've got one potato bed raised bed and then i have two four five six seven seven containers that i grow potatoes in and those seven containers it's the first time i'm growing potatoes in them and they don't have the potato bugs yet so who knows we'll see what happens hopefully i get them under control find all of them before they starts to populate my potato beds melanie says i planted my broad bean from the kitchen and after three times finally success if the bugs don't get to them hopefully the bugs won't get to them but that's good to know that you didn't give up and now you're reaping the benefit hopefully you'll be able to really reap the benefit when those beans start to produce I'm going to try again though. Failure is not an option. Let's see. Melanie says, was weeding this morning and saw a potato. Can't wait to start digging. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. You're fun. It's nice though that you're at this point in time, you're seeing potatoes that you'll be able to harvest soon. Now the good thing is that my potato is doing well, even the one that got eaten by the potato bug, or partially eaten by the potato bug. I'm quite surprised to see that even though the potato bugs are eating that particular plant, it is, it's, I don't know, it seems to be growing faster than all the others, <laughs> than all the others that are in that bed, that is. So I don't know. Russell says, I got, I just googled broad beans. I have only heard of bush and pole beans. Well, I have heard of fava bean, but didn't know it was a broad bean. Okay. Yeah. The lima bean is my favorite. Um, the, broad, the one that they call broad bean that is, seem to be the biggest of the varieties of broad beans and the thickest I don't like that one. I've never eaten it anyway, but I don't like the way it looks. And I think maybe I'm prejudiced to it because when I went out last year and bought the seeds, it said, the packet said broad beans. But then when I got it, it wasn't the bean that I was looking for. So I was disappointed. And then the shape of the bean was, I don't like the shape of the beans. So... The variety that they just plain and simply called broad bean. I don't like that one. Because what I, when I bought it, I was looking for the lima bean, actually. But then in Jamaica, the lima beans, we just call it broad beans or we call it butter beans. So I just went out and bought what package that says broad bean. But then it wasn't the one I was looking for. So now I have a prejudice against that broad bean so i'm gonna have to try and see if i can get some more of the lima okay melanie you planted your potatoes from march that's good yeah i could have planted my potatoes earlier but i was so busy that i didn't get the chance to check my notes and when i checked my notes it was I was behind in planting them, but given that last year I planted them later than I did this year and I still was able to harvest some, then I'm not really concerned about being able to harvest as long as those nasty bugs don't cut it down. But the good thing is that I have a lot of birds in the garden, so maybe those birds will help me out with those bugs. We'll see. And White says, we planted broad beans a lot in the UK. It is a thing. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of all my... Let's see. I love beans. On a whole, I love beans. I don't like fava bean. It's too hard. 
but broad beans the lima beans those are my favorite beans so i wish i had a whole raised bed that i could just put a lot of those in because i could eat those day in and day out <laughs> melanie says i've noticed that and why it is it is all in the uk garden videos okay And when you say broad beans, you're talking about broad beans and not the lima bean, right? Yeah, the lima beans, they are a thing in Jamaica, especially for those who like to eat tripe and beans like myself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, you like it fresh. Okay, so that's what's going on in my garden. I got a lot of work to catch up on in there. Let's see, they are green when mature and brown when dried. Yes, I noticed that. And I think that was the big turn off <laughs> for me. And I don't know why, because it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be, but for some reason, I just think I'm prejudiced because I, it wasn't the lima beans that I was expecting. But for some reason, the shape of it, the color of it when it's dry, it's just... Yeah, maybe I'm crazy. Who knows? <laughs> Can't have that oxtail without the AKA butter beans. Oh, yeah. Oxtail and butter beans. Luscious. Delicious. Oh, yeah. Brought the, the lima bean, it is so, so versatile. So I'm going to be trying this year after my growing season end i'm going to put a few things in the in pots and i'm going to put them back inside my grow room without grow lights last year i did that i put um i brought a lot of things to overwinter indoors without grow lights and i put them by the window but it was too cold by the window for them to grow Surprisingly, though, sweet potatoes that loves heat. I started those in November, February, January, February are the coldest months in the year. But even with that in mind, they still did well on my windowsill. So I don't really know why the other plants, they did well on the windowsill over there. But the plants that were on the windowsill here, they did not do so well. They died, most of them. The only thing that survived was my comfrey. So now I'm wondering if maybe was it the cold? Was it that they weren't getting too enough light? Or could it be that because I built a shelf for them and maybe because plants were stuck behind each other, maybe they didn't, they didn't get enough light. But even those that were directly on the windowsill, they died. So... But this year I'm going to try again and I'm going to make sure I have my grow lights set up just in case for those things that I definitely have to have. Scotch bonnet peppers, I don't know how well they're going to be doing outdoors this year. So I'm definitely going to be overwintering those, at least one of the plants, because the older the plant is, as long as it's not too old, the more it's going to be producing. So definitely i'm going to have to be over entering my scotch bonnet peppers it will be interesting to see what my harvest of scotch bonnet peppers is outdoors okay yes i do sorry i disappeared had to take a call no worries my dear it's all a part of it <laughs> yes it's all a part of it. Anyway, 
it's the kids' lunchtime, so I am 15 minutes. Oh, no. What am I thinking? Hmm. The lunchtime headed, ended a long time ago, and they already had their lunch. <laughs> oh, must be because I'm hungry. I'm thinking that it is their lunch time for them to eat. But anyway... Yeah, if there are no further comments, I'm going to say goodbye. I got to go and get some things done around the house so I can leave for work as soon as my hobby gets here. Just gotta find it. Jot it down before I forget. Because I am very 